So today's seminar is being hosted by the Imperial Network of Excellence in Sustainability through life cycle approaches, quite a mouthful. But I would just like to say a few words about the network before I introduce today's speaker. So the Imperial Life Cycle Network was established to connect life cycle related research and researchers across Imperial College London, but also connect them to the wider UK and international life cycle communities. The network aims to facilitate networking, foster collaborations, as well as to share knowledge and support advancements within the life cycle field. If you'd like any further information about the network, or if you'd like to join the network, please do visit our website, which is noted on the slide, or send us an email, follow us on Twitter, or also for the life cycle practitioners who are based in the UK, please do jo join the Life Cycle Community UK LinkedIn group that is available. This year, 2020, the network launched a virtual seminar series. For those of you who were not able to attend the previous, feel free to visit our events page where you can find either the presentation slides and or the recording available for you to view. But today we are delighted to have Dr. Lawrence Mila E. Canals with us, uh, joining from Paris, where he's the head of the Secretariat of the Life Cycle Initiative, which is hosted by the UN Environment. Now, Lawrence joined uh, UN in 2013 after having worked in uh, academia and industry across both uh, Spain and the United Kingdom. Today, he will be presenting on the interlinkages between life cycle approaches and the sustainable development goals. And he will discuss how his work is supporting the progress towards achieving the SDGs. Please, if you have any questions for the speaker, feel free to type them at any time into the chat box. Daniel from the Imperial Life Cycle Network will then lead the Q&A at the end uh, after the presentation and he will present your questions to the speaker. So without any further delay, I would like to warmly welcome Lawrence. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, the virtual floor is now all yours, so please feel free to share your slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille, and, and thanks uh, to the life cycle, the Imperial <laughs> Life Cycle Network for for inviting me today. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to uh, to be here with you and to have some time to uh, well explain or or present a little bit the work that is being done in UNEP uh, to support the 2030 agenda with uh, with life cycle approaches. Allow me that I took a bit of license in in changing the titles. I mean, we discussed this some months ago, and uh, well, I've been creative <laughs> in the process. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just move around and uh, I hope uh, I trust the slides are, are being seen correctly. So so just the part um, that, that needs to be projected. Uh, so we will see very quickly um, how life cycle approaches are underpinning already the 2030 agenda, including the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> um, and then how we, I, I will just go very, very briefly on how UNEP is contributing to life cycle assessment, but also to, to support uh, the application of life cycle assessment or life cycle approaches uh, in this sustainable development agenda. Um, and then in the end, we'll, we'll make some suggestions and, and hopefully engage you in the discussion on how uh, the life cycle community um, broadly uh, can contribute. And, and obviously you are part of this community. So um, I guess I will not be saying many new things on, on this first part on, on the introduction because you, I'm sure you all know how uh, life cycle assessment and, and life cycle approaches are important uh, in areas like resource efficiency, um, chemicals and waste management and pollution, climate change, product footprints, green technology, uh, consumer behavior and, and, and lifestyle. So, um, it is important as well to find where life cycle approaches are implicitly or explicitly mentioned. I mean, across the SDGs, I've highlighted here some of the most relevant ones, um, but already as well in, in many of the UN environment and UN environment assembly uh, processes, the resolutions that come from, from the UN environment assembly, which is kind of the, the governing body of, of the UNEP, uh, we see already in uh, in the second assembly in uh, in 2016 how uh, life cycle approaches were already um, encouraged and and, uh, and very much part of uh, of the resolutions. 
Um, also in the SDGs, uh, we see it in, in many places, although the only specific mention, in case you've, uh, you've been studying this, the only specific mention is uh, in the SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production and, and concretely on target 12.4, uh, where it relates to the chemicals uh, sector. Um, more uh, recently, in, in last year's uh, United Nations Environment Assembly, the fourth uh, edition or the fourth, um, yeah, the fourth uh, assembly, uh, actually at that point, this is what I call the, the coming of age of LCA and, and life cycle approaches. Um, at least certainly, I mean, of course, the coming of age probably for industry happened decades ago, um, but in the, in the international policy area, we saw that uh, in, in last year's UNEA, Unea 4, as as, uh, as we call it, life cycle assessment was really present all over the uh, all, all over the board. Uh, it was cited in many of the resolutions. Uh, we counted these 20 references to life cycle approaches or LCA directly in in the resolutions that you see linked uh, here um, or or um, mentioned. Also, the ministerial declaration, which is kind of the highest level um, uh, document from from that assembly. Um, it insisted on how we need life cycle approaches to resource management strategies. Uh, you can find all of these documents if if you care to read them um, in the link provided in the slide, which I think the slides will also be provided later. So uh, don't no no need to to take all these notes now. But uh, we will see actually later some of the examples that that came from some of these resolutions. So um, this was very important in terms of ensuring that LCA really gets up at the um, uh, or gets uh, used at the at the highest level. Um, so we've seen then that uh, life cycle assessment and life cycle approaches underpin uh, sustainable development, and this is the reason why uh, UNEP started already hosting life cycle uh, work and concretely the the platform that that we call the life cycle initiative many years ago. I hope actually that many of you are really familiarized uh, <laughs> and today, familiarized at least with, with the life cycle initiative. Today, I will only highlight uh, some specific projects within um, within the initiative uh, that that I found quite relevant for, for you to know. Um, so the life cycle initiative, as, uh, as mentioned, it's a, it's a multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, it was uh, created in 2002, so we're, we're coming near to the 20 years uh, now. Um, and the main idea was to have a platform, have a, an initiative uh, that would uh, enable the global use of credible life cycle knowledge by both private decision makers and, and public policy makers. So the idea was uh, identifying that life cycle approaches are so important, um, but actually are not still widely spread uh, beyond industry, but but also in uh, in developing countries and, and emerging economies. So here, of course, I, I acknowledge, uh, as usual, all the, the funding partners of the Life Cycle Initiative, without whom we would not be here. Um, but obviously, the initiative is much more than that, as, as we will see. Um, so the vision uh, that we have, I mean, I mentioned the mission of uh, enabling the global use of life cycle knowledge. The vision that we have is that uh, the, the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, uh, and other uh, related sustainable development uh, goals or, or ambitions like the Paris Agreement, the vision is that we can achieve these goals faster and more efficiently if we inform decisions and policies with life cycle approaches. And the reason, as you all know, is that uh, life cycle based decisions target the core key drivers, the, the hotspots, because we identify these hotspots uh, in the product system or in the, the production and consumption system. So by tackling these hotspots first, we get to the goals first or earlier. Uh, and also by identifying potential trade offs, we do that more efficiently because we're not uh, kind of achieving one of the SDGs or one of the goals while uh, hampering others. And we do this through the three main uh, work areas that you see highlighted here in, in colors. So um, at the top, we have the technical and policy advice, uh, which is really the area where, uh, as we usually say, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's, it's really about making sure that the relevant process of decision making and policy making have the tools, the life cycle approaches, the data that are necessary uh, in order to inform these decisions. So this is kind of where, where we really bring things uh, to, to use. 
Uh, but this important area is um, supported by uh, two uh, other big programs, uh, which are kind of more the, the probably the, the area of the life cycle initiative that you know more of, which are on kind of this broad basis of uh, life cycle knowledge, the, the key foundation, which which uh, where we have all the work around data um, and around um, impact assessment indicators, uh, new methodologies for LCA. Uh, but then this is uh, kind of brought to the wall through the capacity development program uh, where we make sure that those who are making these decisions and informing these policies have the tools and, and have the knowledge and can use the knowledge um, in, uh, in their day to day work. So to begin with, we'll just see brief some of the key elements in these uh, in these three programs, um, but just highlighting some of the projects as, as mentioned um, that you might be most interested in or, or that hopefully will uh, will uh, get your curiosity so you you go and explore a bit further in terms of the life cycle knowledge so can this foundation program that that we have um, the whole key or the the the, the whole idea here is uh, the, is to offer a solution to access all interoperable LCA databases globally uh, that are connected with a library of recommended impact assessment factors through a nomenclature system, a global nomenclature system. So this is really trying to bring together all the knowledge elements um, and making them available. We are advancing quite a bit on this. Uh, many of you will probably know GLAD, the Global LCA Data Access Network, um, which well, you have the all the links as well here in the in the slide. Glad uh, has the intention of connecting all LCA databases globally. The the map that you see here shows the the bubbles, these these colored bubbles, which have relative size depending on the amount of LCA data sets that are available for each one of these countries. So obviously there are some big hotspots in, in Europe, North America, also Brazil, and Asia, uh, but. You know, little by little, there's uh, there's uh, there's well, all the other countries which are also coming uh, to the to the fore. Um, we also have quite a lot of support for 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 LCA database um, national LCA database generation, and and here we've been providing quite a lot of resources uh, in the last couple of years, which are also facilitated both through the website of the initiative, but also a new website that we're just launching, uh, this help desk dot lifecycle initiative dot org. Um, this is this is also a website where we're trying to put in touch the experts, particularly local experts from around the world with those who are trying to develop new LCA databases. So hopefully you will find plenty of resources here that are interesting. Um, another key part of this uh, knowledge is the work on impact assessment, which you could say is actually kind of the <laughs> it, it's almost the the reason to be or the initial reason to be of the life cycle initiative, which out of the necessity to have a global body that would recommend impact assessment factors. We've come a long way in the in the almost 20 years of history of the initiative. Um, and right now, as many of you, I think, are already aware, uh, we're working on uh, on a global life cycle impact assessment method. So this builds on uh, on the, the successes of the previous years, uh, which uh, again are also all, all on the website. So hopefully many of you are already engaged with this process. If not, and if you're active in the impact assessment area, I hope that you will want to be joining uh, our efforts. So moving on, uh, in, in the area of life cycle capacity development, we are, um, well, obviously providing quite a lot of resources as well uh, in the last uh, almost two decades. As of late, we've been putting much more efforts into generating e-learning modules that can be accessed by the biggest number of uh, of people. Um, resources are never enough to do face-to-face uh, -face trainings, and in any case, in these days, it's uh, well, uh, we're, we 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 have a big constraint there. Um, however, we really want to reach uh, as many people as possible with at least the first introductory modules. So. We have this introduction to life cycle thinking, uh, which is uh, use, very usable for a, for a broad audience who are not aware of life cycle thinking. We then have also other specific modules for decision making and for, for policy making. 
I really encourage you to use them. I'm sure that if you're already in the Imperial Lifecycle Network, um, you probably don't need <laughs> this level of, uh, of um, capacity development, but probably through your networks, uh, you will find people that, that would find these, um, these uh, modules very useful. Uh, and actually, uh, we also have, uh, we're kind of currently trying to set up agreements with, uh, with universities. So if your university uh, is not yet uh, using these uh, these modules in in their broader dissemination of life cycle thinking. Please do get in touch. It would be great to um, to have agreements with you on how we can make this better together. Okay, um, so until now we've seen essentially how we're contributing to setting the, these enabling conditions to to use life cycle assessment and life cycle approaches. But of course, the key point about LCA is that it needs to be applied. It's it's an apply. It's a tool to support decision making. If it's not being used to support decision making, then well, it's a waste of time. So in essence, uh, what we're going to do now is to see how uh, we're we're using in UNEP life cycle assessment and life cycle approaches at all possible levels. Um, so in this next slide, we will just provide. Uh, we'll see some of the examples that illustrate how we're using it. Um, I'm using for this the diagrams that uh, that we created in an old paper, <laughs> starting from the the typical use of LCA, which is the product level. Uh, this is this is really where where it all started, if you want. Um, and in this context, or in the context of one of the resolutions that I mentioned earlier from from the United Nations Environment Assembly, its fourth edition, uh, there was this resolution that was actually requesting UNEP to make available information on the life cycle impacts of single use plastic products and their alternatives. So you will all have heard, of course, uh, there's a heated debate and, and lots of uh, work going on around plastics and plastics pollution. How should we uh, go about it? Well, it was really a big deal that member states, uh, most of whom had not heard about life cycle assessment before, they agreed that, well, something has to be done about the pollution from single use plastic products. But it was also very clear that not all alter alternatives are actually better or are leading to improvement in all environmental areas. So it was already a big deal that they said, yes, but we want to inform our decisions on how to deal with single use plastic. Uh, we want to inform these decisions with LCA. So uh, for that, UNEP, uh, through the Life Cycle Initiative, pulled together um, meta studies on, on life cycle assessments of single use plastic products and their alternatives, pulled them together, or we are actually still pulling them together in a series of reports. The three covers that you see here in the, in the screenshot um, are the ones that are already available online. So they are on, on single use plastic bags and their alternatives. Uh, single-use plastic bottles and single-use uh, plastic takeaway. That's that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, you get the picture of of what it is. Um, so please, you can consult these um, these studies already. There's there's additional studies on on cups, uh, beverage cups, on tableware. Um, there's also feminine hygiene products, nappies, and face masks. Um, so we're pulling everything that we found, which I have to say for some of these categories is not very much in terms of LCA studies. Uh, but the idea is that with these, we're then informing policymakers and, and bringing LCA where, where it's most needed. Moving on, because I, I know we want to save some time for discussion and for questions in the end. Um, we, we go one step up uh, and then in the diagram, as you can see, we're going beyond the product into the organization and even the sector. So here we've also been doing quite a lot of work. Of course, in, in UNEP, uh, the, the, the wall is our scope. So if we go product by product, we, we're not going to get very far. So we often work at the sector level and we've been applying these life cycle approaches to identify hotspots and then guide decision making in sectors like plastics. Well, it's not that it's a sector, but we, we treat it as one. We've used as well in, in tourism, in textiles, in food, in the chemical sector. So we've been applying it in, uh, in many areas. Um, and we'll see just one of these examples, um, which is the, the example of plastics, as I was mentioning. We've been applying life cycle approaches at actually many different levels, and we are applying it. Uh, again, the links will take you to more information. 
but at the global level, we've been working with uh, many partners, including, well, uh, in, a, in a Jeff funded project, uh, Jeff being the, the global environment facility, together with the Alan MacArthur Foundation um, and others, we've been providing recommendations for global actions to tackle plastics pollution with a systemic approach. Uh, this approach actually led to uh, what many of you may know, which is the new plastics economy global commitment. This is a global commitment led by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in collaboration with UNEP, uh, which identifies the key actions that each one of the actors of the plastics value chain should take in order to move the economy, to shift the needle and to, to shift the needle, if you want, of, the, of, the, of circularity. Uh, plastics uh, being one of the most linear systems that we can think of, we are suggesting which are the, the key tasks, the key actions that each actor of the value chain should take in order to bend the curve and, and to make this more circular. And of course, this, this uh, involves both the private sector and also the governments. So UNEP is in charge of the governments uh, and, and the, the, the commitments that they make while the Ella Macro Foundation is, is in charge of the private sector. Um, one level down, we worked much more on kind of practical tools, this national guidance for plastic hotspots that, that you see here in the middle. This is a practical tool to identify uh, where, plastic, uh, where plastic products are leaking from the economy. So which parts of the value chain, which are the actors which are responsible, and from this quantitative information of the plastic leaks, we can then inform uh, and shape the actions that uh, that will be most useful. So that's something that we've co-developed with the IUCN and, and obviously knowledge partners as well. Some, some of them might be here, EA and, and Qantas. Uh, we've been working on this project and now we've, we're applying it and repli uh, replicating it in, in many countries around the world. And at the bottom, you see also the, the work that we're doing, which is kind of much more at the knowledge development Lawrence, I think you went on mute. It says that someone muted me. Apparently, somebody is not liking what I'm saying. Did it say who? I, I, <laughs> I hope. Rebecca. I hope. Uh, yeah, thank you for that because I didn't realize I didn't see any sign. Um, I hope that wasn't for too long. Uh, but anyway, maybe I'll, I'll just move on from this slide uh, to to um, to enable us to finish on time. Now I need to get back in. There you go. Fantastic. So we've seen product level, we've seen uh, organization and sector level applications. Um, now we could also apply life cycle approaches at the lifestyle or at the, uh, you know what, looking at the individual, the household, and how uh, many life cycles actually cross our lives. Um, and with life cycle approaches, we can help inform where are the key drivers, where are the key hotspots in our uh, in our consumption, in our uh, way of being or way of living. Um, so the one of the products that we've recently launched um, is this little book of green nudges. Uh, this is I, I oriented to well to universities really, but I would say any educational institution could use it. It's really about how to use uh, green nudges and in order to help uh, shift uh, behaviors um, at a moment in life where people are more ready to perhaps consider the way that they are going to be living. Um, again, this is this is uh, something that is informed by LCA in order to um, point at those areas that are um, those areas in um, in the student's life that are more uh, impactful. Uh, and I know that they've been also calling at many universities to join. I know many British universities have joined uh, in trying this little book of green nudges. I'm not sure about the Imperial, so uh, so please check it. And if you're not there, uh, please join uh, the campaign. Um, working as well at the individual level, uh, I would like to introduce you to the anatomy of action, where um, we have been distilling many LCA studies. Uh, I mean, we being with also with with our partners, the Unschool, uh, as you see the logo there. They've been pulling together the learnings from many many LCA studies that tell us what are the key actions that anybody can take in their lives in order to drive down uh, the impacts. 
so here you see, I mean, in this, uh, this graph here, there's actually a hyperlink. So later on, you can go and see the activation video, which is very a bit. I hope you'll like it. Um, but also I put the link to the validation report where you can see the studies that were used in order to inform the 15 uh, actions that we are suggesting in, in these five different areas of life. And the key point here was, you know, to use the hand as a, as a net memoir to, to remind you about the things that we're talking about, the, the food, the stuff, the move, the money, the fun, the, these five key areas of your life where you can actually do things um, in order to improve your lifestyle. So, um, just, just to get this a bit more personal, and I think yeah, we still have some time, so I'm not going to be uh, asking for your interventions on this, but I thought, you know, to put a bit of action and a bit of fun in this, uh, it would be great if you could now, you know, choose what are the actions from here, or, you know, if you know another one that for you personally would work, uh, you know, maybe share them in the chat, or even better, you know, share them in your social media. Make a pledge. What is it that you're going to do differently? Uh, maybe you can also make it into one of your new year resolutions now that you're getting into that into that point. Um, but maybe just just to give you a bit of time for reflection that that also gives me a cue maybe to have a sip of my tea. So anyway, um, please feel free to share this as well in the chat and maybe we can later vote who got the best one. Um, now we are we're, we're now moving to the to to the end of the of the presentation. Um, of course, when talking about the UN, uh, our natural counterparts are our member states, our governments. So how do we use life cycle approaches or life cycle assessment when we're informing decisions at the country level, which is many times the decisions that, that governments are facing? Uh, so here you already see a few listed. I mean, we're assessing countries as a whole from a life cycle perspective, essentially with national footprints to guide sustainable consumption and production, green economy policies, so action plans that countries may want to incorporate into, the, into their development strategies. Um, lately, we've also been working quite a lot, as we will see, in um, informing nationally determined contributions in, in the context of the Paris Agreement. You know that these have to be enhanced every, every few years. Uh, also informing the longer term climate change strategies of countries. We're helping countries by providing them with a good picture of what are the key hotspots, the key sectors in their economy that are driving most of these impacts, uh, but not just on greenhouse gases, but also on other impacts. And the tool that we've been developing for this, again, in, in partnership with, um, in this case, with University of Vienna and CSIRO in, um, in Australia, is the uh, Sustainable Consumption and Production Hotspot Analysis Tool, or SCP HAT. As you can see, we're not very gifted with names in, in UNEP, so <laughs> if you ever come across a good name for uh, for these kind of tools, please uh, please uh, suggest it. Um, the SCP HAT, you can find it available in the website that is provided. We're, we're currently uh, updating the tool as well, by the way, um, but anyway, the, the tool that you will find today online is already super powerful and very useful. Um, these three screenshots here are of the three main modules that we're looking at. The first one, country profile, is quite static, but it already gives you uh, very good information of any of the 171 countries that are already uh, in the tool. Um, I mean, this is based on input-output tables, so we don't have these input-output tables for all the countries in the world, but we're almost there. So 171 countries covered. Uh, in the SCP hotspots, module, which is the second module, this is really the most powerful place where you can actually find a contribution from different economic sectors, um, see what are the contributions in terms of different uh, types of impacts, different emissions, etc. Compare this, compare the countries, uh, compare different countries, compare different sectors. It's pretty cool. So um, just a, a quick screenshot from uh, from the SCP HUD. Well, actually, the graph that you see here is not in the SCP hat, but it's a compilation of all the results. So we see the, the average contribution in the world of the different uh, 26 sectors that we distinguish in, in, in SCP hat, the contribution of these 26 sectors to um, three key environmental impacts on climate change, pollution and, and nature loss uh, that we represent with um, impacts on biodiversity from land use. Um, so from these, we can already start guiding at least the attention to those sectors where it matters the most. 
And as mentioned before, we're also applying this tool to uh, support countries in enhancing uh, their nationally determined contributions. So here would you see, and, and sorry, I actually picked a slide now I see in, uh, in Spanish. Um, we're doing quite a lot of um, work, uh, particularly in countries in, in Latin America, not just the, their nationally determined contributions, but also to guide uh, green recovery processes. So um, in, in, uh, in the economic recovery plans that are being drafted in many countries, some of them are already ongoing, but actually the part of the green uh, of the economic recovery that is usually ongoing is kind of ensuring that some key sectors do not fail. Uh, now the big uh, opportunity is, is in the longer term investments, uh, which we can inform, well, you know, if you're investing in this particular sector with uh, specific policies that foster, you know, more circularity in the economy, more resource efficiency, more sustainable consumption and production, you could actually, you know, boost the economy while at the same time hitting the targets that you have for the SDGs, for, for Paris Agreement, etc. So it's a very exciting moment. It's it's a moment of opportunity. Uh, somebody said, and I always forget, you know, don't, <laughs> don't waste a good crisis. Um, of course, with all the, the, the tragedy that this pandemic um, ends, it is also the time, it's now or never almost, uh, the time where we can really put the investment where it really matters. And, and it's a good moment in the sense that the finance sector, the, the investors have realized this. Uh, there is more momentum than ever in, in terms of being convinced that we need to put the money where it really matters and where it really helps. So. Let's hope we get it right. And, and certainly with the SCP hat, we're informing uh, many of these countries. Let's hope that others will also be using this tool or, or other tool or of similar tools um, to inform their, their strategies and their plans. So with this, um, and I think uh, I probably sped up a little bit, but uh, I think the idea was also to give as much time as, uh, as possible for the discussion. Um, I wanted also to make a plea and to, to um, try and find how uh, and where the life cycle community, that's, that's all you, can contribute most and, and where we would like uh, to have your engagement. Um, so, of course, in the area, and, and probably you're, many of you are working on developing data, uh, perhaps sharing as well LCA data, uh, it would be great uh, to have you connect uh, the LCA data with um, the GLAD platform that, that I mentioned before. Uh, you know, this is the, the connection of the data. The whole idea is to make the metadata available so people can find that data exists. Even if your data are not for free, uh, connecting them in GLAD is helping others identify your data and possibly uh, getting also more, more attention for, for it. Uh, and of course, if your data are for free, then please put them there because I guess your main interest is that the data are used. Uh, and GLAD is, is certainly uh, one of the best ways today that your data will be found and then used. Um, in terms of impact assessment, perhaps many of you are also uh, active in, in developing impact assessment methods. I mentioned before, we're working towards a global uh, life cycle impact assessment method. Please join the effort. This is uh, the effort that we're, well, we're expecting to, co to, to accomplish by 2023. So this is a longer term project. But there's a lot of work along the way and, and all hands are needed on the deck. Um, in, in terms of impact assessment, we're also uh, developing and, and the Life Cycle Initiative has also been uh, a key reference for social impacts and, and bring the whole sustainability assessment uh, to, to the life cycle community. The new revised social LCA guidance will be published um, hopefully <laughs> by the end of this year. So that's in the next two or three weeks. The, the final document is already available, but we're kind of fine tuning and, and tweaking some of the, the latest things that, that needed to be done. Um, so it will be there in this year. Uh, we have already started uh, pilot testing the, the new revised guidelines with several organizations. Um, if you would be interested as well, please do get in touch. Um, it would be great to, to have it tested more broadly. Um, and of course, uh, it's it's helpful as well. I mean, in LCA, we tend to get very very focused on specific systems, on on specific products that that we like or that we that you know we get funding to to assess. Try and take one step back and also help push you know the the system wide applications. 
how can we help the decision makers really focused on on those aspects that really shift the needle the needle of you know the environmental metrics the sustainability metrics of what we need to change in our society in our economy please help us by by applying this more and in general just help uh, as 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 you all do already uh, in pushing the systems transformation that we need we really need to transform the way we do business the way in the way we 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 go about uh, in society lca is uh, crucial for this and life cycle approaches are crucial for this so keep applying lca and perhaps almost as importantly talk about it so once you're applying your your results please in, ensure that they are known uh, and if for that we can help you from the life cycle initiative i mean we do publish success stories of where lca has really helped in forming decisions that you know transform uh, organizations transform businesses in in uh, in getting you know the the environmental impacts addressed or or perhaps even the business model more successful uh, we then apply these uh, stories so they inform and uh, convince others uh, so inspire others in, in taking action so please keep doing it and, and share your results if um, if you can and if if you want to to have them disseminated through the life cycle initiative um, and with this, uh, again, I think I, I pressed on uh, significantly. Hopefully it was all clear and um, in any case, the slides will be available. So now, hopefully, there will be still time for uh, many questions, I hope. Um, so please keep them in, keep them coming in and, uh, and I'll be here for a while. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Lawrence, for a really, a really fascinating talk. Um, I will put my own questions to the side and just go straight to the chat um, to see what other people have to say. Um, so we have a question from Rosa um, asking if you could just talk a bit more about the actions that are being done to facilitate and, and to use lifecycle approaches and tools in developing countries. Excellent. So, wow, I mean, the question could be answered in many different ways, I guess. I mean, specific projects that we're doing um, are certainly a lot around the capacity development. So we, whenever we can uh, generate resources, particularly in order to support um, specific organizations, small and medium sized enterprises, or what we call uh, business multipliers. So technology centers, uh, cleaner technology and or cleaner production uh, centers, we help them with tools, we help them with um, with training, so they then apply uh, these things, usually with SMEs, the small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, a current example of that is a, is a project funded by the European Commission, which focuses on the textile sector uh, in Africa. So we will be working in, in three countries uh, in Africa, supporting specific companies to apply methodologies like the the product environmental footprint of uh, of the ec and i think we we heard about it last um last month obviously with certainly la sala so um that would be a, a specific case more recently uh i mean actually last week i was in um in a meeting as well with the latin american and caribbean coffee network that have been developing as well tools to adapt the pef the, the product environmental footprint and, and use it in their um, in their production. So we have been supporting the capacity development related to it. Um, so producers are actually ready to generate the data, inform their processes and inform their decisions, but also then to share data once this is required, for instance, in, in the green market uh, in Europe. So these are a couple of examples, but well, certainly I guess we could, I mean, if there's any other specific question of, of specific sectors or something, maybe uh, I can talk of other things, but hopefully that was illustrative enough. Well, I, actually, I think that leads actually quite well onto the, the next question, which was, which raised the fact that there was very little data in that map that seems to be coming from Africa specifically. So so how did how do you deal with that uncertainty in databases or where there's sort of gaps in the information that you're that you're able to get? Well, absolutely. I think that, I mean, yeah, Africa is probably one of the key uh, gaps that we have uh, currently in terms of data, but things are improving. And, and then projects like this one, one of the um, side objectives of this project, if you want, is actually to generate LCA data and to generate capacity to generate LCA data. So, of course, the way to deal with gaps, um, 
we've we've heard that in um, in LCA for many years, and and that's been one of my favorite areas as well. It's how to deal with uh, data gaps and and how to bridge the gaps when you have more gaps. I mean, it's not that you have gaps; you have actually islands of data in a notion of of no data, uh, and certainly having you know, even data from another country can often be better than not having any data at all. At least that's that's really my motto. So helping countries to, you know, identify the data that would be better for them, adapt the data, and then of course using that while you generate your own data. Uh, I think that's that's really an approach that we're using. Um, but as mentioned, I mean, a lot of our efforts are to help um, countries uh, to generate their own LCA databases to, to, to help researchers in countries to pull things together in order to have their databases. And we have a good example. I mean, one of the recent uh, countries that we were supporting is Uganda. Uh, of course, in Africa, you, you have one big area which is already getting hotter in terms of data, which is South Africa. I mean, South Africa is a different continent probably, but uh, but in Uganda, in, in other countries uh, in Africa, we've been also supporting initial steps to towards LCA data and, and things are getting better. I mean, obviously you have to be optimistic. Um, we have a, a slightly uh, different question from Thomas relating more towards the SDGs um, and asking about how the these LCA support practices will actually be used towards like oriented towards the SDGs um, and and if you could give any examples of that of uh, yeah how that's that's being done. The, again, many different ways of answering, but uh, specific things that we're doing. I mean, there's first there's I mean, I didn't speak of all the projects that that are ongoing. There's actually one project that is using the life cycle approach to inform uh, companies, uh, in this case, particularly businesses, but also other types of organizations. It helps them through the life cycle approach. It helps them see which of the SDGs and SDG indicators could be most relevant as well for their strategy. Mm -hmm. So this is on the one hand helping uh, the non-state actors. Of course, the SDGs have been designed for governments, um, but we're helping the non-state actors to um, identify how they can also contribute to the SDGs. Then, of course, there's the other area, which is, well, uh, for some of the SDGs, life cycle assessment, life cycle approaches is very important, even though it's only implicitly important. So you have SDGs that want to improve energy efficiency. Well, if you don't have an LCA approach, you might actually improve the efficiency in the wrong life cycle stage, if you want, or in the wrong life cycle or in the wrong uh, te technology or process. So we're also kind of trying to bring this top down approach. Unfortunately, not many of the SDG indicators finally incorporated a life cycle perspective. Uh, I mean, many of you may have realized that, you know, carbon footprint would be an obvious indicator. Well, at the moment that the uh, SDGs were being agreed, carbon footprint was really not known by the majority of member states, so they didn't accept it. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I tell you, we were putting uh, quite a lot of pressure to have at least carbon footprint as a, as a key indicator, it, it was not accepted. So we still have a lot of work to do to keep improving the SDG indicators with more life cycle data. So that's also an area that that we try to do uh, to, to work on. And again, it has to be an incomplete answer, but <laughs> hopefully that's that's good enough. And otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with uh, any more details that you need. Um, so we have a question with regards to the SCP hat tool um, and, and if there's plans to develop a similar tool for regional or, or local analysis um, in, to help them get to the, the, the greenhouse gas emission goals and the net zero goals by 2050. Yeah, no, that's just that's a super interesting question. I mean, the, the SCP hat and I didn't go into the details. Uh, I just mentioned it's built on input output tables. Uh, it's actually built on multi-regional input output tables. Uh, these data are essentially available at the country level. Um, the, the key point is all the time, do we have the data for this? If you have an input output table for your sub-national, so your regional uh, level, then you can certainly use already SCP HAT. Uh, I didn't mention the module three because that's the module I, I never use. It's, it's a module where uh, the user can actually replace the existing data in the SCP HAT with their own data uh, if they have you know more accurate data more recent data 
you can do that. You can also create your own data for a new region if you want. So if you have the data, you can use the SCP HUD. But the problem, of course, is that um, we need to provide a tool that is global in perspective. Right now, we don't have any database which provides this kind of level of disaggregation at input output level for regions in the world. So it wouldn't make sense for us to include one or two regions and not include the others. Uh, I mean, we're already getting in trouble if we, you know, accidentally put there uh, uh, a country or a territory that is not a member state. We're currently we're, we're very quickly told off by uh, other member states that don't like that kind of um, political statement. This is being recorded, right? Oh, bugger, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway. <laughs> uh, we can blur it out or something. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> um, so the question with regards to developing uh, global impact assessment methods and, and how the, they, when it becomes regions, it's obviously highly specific in those cases. And, and the, are there different methods, basically? And are, and, so let me just read this again verbatim actually so will will there be efforts around harmonization of new lcia methods between the global and the regional um side um well the so the global method includes spatial differentiation where it makes sense so in the global method that we would be recommending definitely spatial differentiation is is recognized as something that is necessary and then depending on the impact category um, this spatial differentiation will be, you know, on the basis of ecoregions, on the basis of, um, you know, are you in a, in a densely populated area or not in a densely populated area? Uh, is it the level of watersheds? Is it the level? So these different uh, levels is already brought in. And the idea of, with the global recommendation is to see what is the best approach to regional differentiation. So in principle, uh, this would be already incorporated. Uh, and that's 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 what makes this also quite complicated. Um, then, of course, uh, I, I picked another kind of question there in terms of will there be ongoing harmonization? Of course, the idea is you can recommend what seems to be the best approach by the time you publish it. And one year or maybe one month later, it's already obsolete because maybe there's already something else. The idea of the life cycle initiative is not to stop uh, methodological development. The idea is that you know, by providing global recommendations, as, as we've already been doing for individual impact categories, uh, you say, well, at the time when we're making this recommendation, this is the best approach. And actually, if we fix that approach, at least for a few years, that gives stability as well to the application of the method. It doesn't mean that it will always be like that, because if in the meantime there are evolutions and new methods come in that we can then incorporate, well, you know, a little while later, maybe every two or three or five years, uh, we can come up with an update. So maybe that's also another another uh, area where we want to be seeing how to incorporate these things in the in the best way. But yeah, maybe two different elements of the of the question. Hopefully that that was okay. Uh, yeah, if, if there's a follow up, we'll we'll definitely go to that. Um, so we have a question with regards to barriers and resistance to your work obviously you make recommendations but but do you encounter resistance from the companies or the countries and and if you do how do you how do you deal with that you see that's that's a very interesting question and yes of, of course there is uh, sometimes resistance it's interesting that i think with the application of life cycle approaches and with putting all the information out there you tend to easily lower the resistance. So many times the resistance is about, oh, well, but you know, maybe this is your method and it's not the method that, you know, if you had applied mine, and that's a problem we have with LCA, but honestly, we have that problem with any assessment that, that we would be using. Yeah. The fact that you're already putting this information out there, and actually, and particularly now, the fact that we're putting the life cycle results at the request of the member states, once they see it, they automatically have to lower the resistance. There certainly is sometimes resistance from, from private sector when you're invested in one specific type of technology or material or product. Uh, if if the recommendation from, from the science is, well, actually, maybe you have this problem or that problem and alternative products or technologies are more advisable or, or recommended. Well, 
you know, of course, you're going to resist, but at the same time, it's also a, a powerful way to say, you know what, maybe you have to change your product or you have to change your technology. Um, so I think, yeah, perhaps that we are seeing, for instance, a lot of resistance and a lot of opposition in certain country practices or policies in the area of plastics, for instance. But usually this resistance is also because many member states have not been basing their decisions on life cycle assessment. So a, a key example, many countries will go out there and ban uh, a specific type of plastic product. And that's, to be fair, that's usually the best thing that they can do because they don't have alternatives in terms of technology, etc. But that's something that then maybe many times the private sector will will complain about because they will say, well, but if we prove from an LCA point of view that the alternatives that are coming into the market are worse, what then? So, so that's generating a lot of confusion. What we're doing now is we're putting all this information of LCA studies so it can show towards which type of product um, the the LCA results so show that this is this is going to be better. Once you have this information out there, nobody can really complain if the policy has been designed taking this into account. I could go on on this example as, as, as it's it's a pretty recent one, but yeah, I don't want to take all the time talking <laughs> plastics. Um, so we have a question with regards to the, the SDGs again, and if there are any sort of challenges or, or shortcomings, I guess, with using life cycle approaches for trying to tackle or advise the, the SDGs. I mean, I guess the, the key challenge that comes to mind is the fact that, as, as I said, many times the, the uh, LCA results are far more detailed than the SDG indicators. And, you know, what's the first question that all my colleagues in UNEP, when, I, when, when we talk about the SCP HAD, and they see the, the wealth of information that is in the SCP HAD, the first thing they believe is, OK, so this is going to inform me about the progress in, in, in SDG indicators, right? Well, no. It informs you of one indicator, which is the material footprint, because there's no other indicator that is based on on a life cycle approach in in the SDGs. Therefore, that's that's kind of a big challenge. Uh, it would be nice if perhaps we we might even be able to add one or two uh, additional indicators in the SDGs that are LCA based, and they will then be informed by LCA. But otherwise. Yes, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge. We can certainly use the LCA and, and, and life cycle approaches to say, well, you know, this specific um, approach or policy will help us, for instance, achieve one of the SDGs, but it's also already raising alerts that perhaps you're going in the wrong direction for other SDG areas. But certainly we will not be able to link it to the point of the indicators simply because the indicators are not LCA based. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Um, so we have a question. No, uh, we have a question about um, the how we use life cycle uh, approaches for um, for communication side of things, rather than like as a scientific tool, it's very very useful. But how do we improve its its application in the communication side? Yeah, well, that's I guess the the million dollar question. That's um, how to answer that. The the examples that. I've shown, I think hopefully none of them uh, gave you the results of an LCA. Uh, the, the place where you're going to see the closest results to, to what we do in LCA are these uh, LCA meta studies of uh, single use plastic products and their alternatives. Everything else that I've shown, it's actually using a life cycle approach, but then it, it, it kind of brings the information to another level uh, of, of, uh, of kind of portraying this information that is actually closer to what the decision maker is needing. Uh, perhaps the most extreme case is this, uh, th the work on lifestyles. Uh, because the work on lifestyles, I mean, you're talking to individuals, we, we're pretty complex creatures. Um, the the nudges, that's, that's already kind of, it's a level that probably an LCA practitioner, and, and I am, or I was one of those, um, <laughs> you know, when you see how the information has been boiled down to a nudge it's it's you know it's it's dumbing down but it's you can also see it as it we're, you're really taking the essential information what's really the essential bit of information that the consumer needs consumer the the, the citizen needs similar with the anatomy of action at the end of the day they we cannot really process all, all the all the wealth of information that is in the lca so you really have to help 
bring down what's the essential bit that will really shift the decision towards the right direction, particularly when you're taking thousands of decisions per minute. Um, so I guess that's one key part. Uh, another key part, I mean, of course, the the work on eco labels and and the communication of environmental footprint. There's there's fascinating work going on in um, in the European Commission. Uh, there's work as well on on how to make this digital and how to bring it to to the level of a of a digital product passport. Uh, well, we'll see how this how this evolves. But certainly, I think in terms of the communication, there's a lot that we still need to learn from, you know, uh, behavioral psychologists and 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 the people who are experts at communicating with um, with the users with with individuals. Sorry, that was an answer. I I know, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, when you mentioned the green nudges, I, I mean, personally, I don't think I'd actually come across them. So I'm, <laughs> that's like my number one thing to look up after afterwards to see what, where, yeah, where those sort of pointers are for like, you know, the general audience. Um, I think we're going to have only a few more questions as we're getting well, one last question as we're almost near the end, uh, unless you'd be happy for more. Um, uh, a question with regards to the, the difficulty with consistency um uh, across the, the lca community and if that's also an issue an issue for social um lcas um and then how to address that wow yeah that's that's uh, <laughs> that's a, a big, big question, question. Yeah. for the last one i mean i guess um and, and i guess also sometimes we're, we're asked about this i mean whether we would go into a harmonized one voice I don't think that's possible. I mean, the life cycle community, and here we're we're really talking. I mean, in UNEP, we're we're trying to bring together a, a global life cycle community. There's probably as many voices as LCA practitioners. Um, so, however, certainly, I think we we can um, we can get together around specific uh, decisions and discussions which which make things more comparable, and that's important as well. I mean, we need to be able to compare results. At the end of the day, I mean, uh, my <laughs> our, our dear friend Olivier Joyer, uh, many of you will know him. He talks of LCA as the art of science-based comparison. So we're we're really making comparison of things possible. Um, the more inconsistencies we bring in, uh, well, <laughs> the less comparable things are. So I think certainly there is an effort in in many fronts. I mean, when in in specific applications like like the PEF that I mentioned before. The effort there is precisely to remove everything which is inconsistent. Um, when particularly now in, in, in something as new, even if it's 10 or, or, or 12 years old, uh, as, as social life cycle assessment that, that you were mentioning in the second part of the question, uh, it's still very difficult because people are testing new things and that's absolutely necessary. I think we're developing the methodology. Uh, you cannot bring everything to a consistent, uniform way of doing things. At the same time, it's important to agree from time to time, OK, let's do this as the agreed recommended way forward. And at the same time, keep playing uh, in, in the sandbox. I mean, keep experimenting with new things because maybe you're going to find a better way to to assess. Um, again, I think that was that wasn't an answer. Sorry for that, but uh, <laughs> I think you need both. You need specific applications um, and then keep trying things to to uh, well to come up with better ways of going uh, moving forward. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Lorenz, for a really, really, really interesting talk and lots to lots of links and lots to look up after that and uh, lots to, to pass on to, to other people that couldn't be here to to for, to enjoy and to, to learn from you. And I should have mentioned, obviously, that all the questions came with a, a really big thank you for the, for the talk. Um, I'd like to thank Lawrence again um, from on behalf of all of us and the Imperial Lifecycle Network. Thank all of you for for attending tonight. Um, and just to say that there will be more seminars in the future. We will be announcing them in the new year. So if you aren't already a member, please join the network or um, subscribe so you can find out uh, more via our our uh, social media streams. So yeah, thanks again, Lorenz, for ten, for tonight's talk, and and thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks everyone for staying until the end. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.